Josh, do we have some exciting news to share? Oh my God, I'm so excited. Here's what we're doing. Friday, December 16th at 5.30 p.m., myself and Josh are collaborizing with the On The Tape podcast. That's Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, and Danny Moose. What are we doing? We are doing a live podcast from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. The tickets are $100. All of the proceeds are going to No Kid Hungry. The tickets are going to go fast. Press pause. Hit the link. It's in the show Where notes. Where is the link? It's in the description right now. They could see it on the app. It's right there, right, Nicole? Like it's- All right. So we're raising money for No Kid Hungry. 100 of you will get to come live at the NASDAQ market site, December 16th. What time are we 5:30. doing this? 5.30 p.m. There will be drinks. There will be food. There will be merriment. It's all happening. Make sure you do that, and we'll see you there. Today's show is brought to you by Composer. For those unfamiliar with this new, cool, and exciting tool, picture this. Portfolio Visualizer meets Fidelity? Here's what I'm trying to say. If you have ever back-tested a strategy, either manually or with another site, you could actually put those back-tests to work. You could back-test, you could implement the ideas, good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, you could use other people's ideas. We had Ben Rollard on Animal Spirits. If you want to hear like a full discussion of who Composer is and where they came from and all that sort of stuff. For more information, go to composer.trade slash brochure. Episode 72. When did we start this? June of uh, 2021. 21. 21. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the compound and friends, Jeff DeGraff is here. I am so excited about this show. Jeff, we wrote you an intro. Can I read it to you? Please. Okay. Jeff is the chairman and head of technical research at Renaissance Macro Research, an institutional buy-side macro research firm. Sell side. Jeff, right? Got sell it? Sell side. Uh, where does that go? We're sell side. Institutional no, sell side. side. We're so- who, 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 who did this? Don't get you fired. Fired. Uh, Jeff is a frequent contributor to CNBC and is a member of the Institutional Investors Hall of Fame. Jeff DeGraff, welcome to the show. Thank Thanks you for so having much. me. Thank you for doing My this. My pleasure. Uh, you've been sell side. Jeff, Jeff is a favorite of a fan favorite. Like, doesn't is it JC obsessed with Jeff? I've just told him that. Like, whenever whenever I ask JC who's, who's the, the who's the man, yeah, Jeff old, DeGraff yeah. is the man. Been hearing that for years. Hmm. Why do you think people uh, feel so? fervently about you being Bro, he's the got guy. the dopest charts. <laughs> That's what J- JC. Bro, have you seen his charts? Oh, man. I, I Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I, sh- I should ask my mother. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I think I think one of the, the things that we've done well uh, in our process um, and, and career is just be very consistent, right? Okay. And we think about things, um, you know, almost monotonically. I mean, you have to be creative in this business for sure, but there are certain boundaries with, within which you have to you have to work. And um, you know, we've always been big believers in credit. Well, before credit was even a thing, um, we've been big believers in sentiment and trend. And I think one of the things that's built our credibility over time is that we test everything. So we don't just throw it out there; we test it. Um, it was a big reason for starting my own firm was building a database, writing the software, having this ability to really go through and make sure that the spaghetti stuck on the wall when, you know, there were ideas out there. Um, and and then owning that, that. As, and, and then owning that as IP. And then absolutely owning that, right? Because right. if you do it for somebody else, you know, it's for, gone. Right. When right. did you start the company? Uh, Pi Day 2011. Okay. That was, the math guys love that. That was just a coincidence. So you're tw- uh, 12 years in yeah. and prior Lehman? Prior to that ISI, ISI for four years, Lehman for about 10, and then Merrill Lynch before that. Okay. So you've always been on the sell side. I've always been on the sell side. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for Michael, what does monotonically mean? <laughs> <laughs> incrementally Stare higher stat. or incrementally lower, correct? Stare Come on, stat. man. Okay. I thought you were doing Wu-Tang. I thought you were saying I bomb atomically. <laughs> Socrates philosophy. What? Don't take, don't, don't tape me doing that. Okay. Uh, so listen, this is like an amazing, not a coincidence, but like it's a very momentous time for us to have you here because this week – I think technically, or maybe you'll tell me I'm wrong about this, I think technically a lot of things might have potentially changed from the prior primary trends that we've all been living through this year. Um, notably, at least for somebody that's not a technician, the S&P retaking its uh, 200-day moving average to the upside. Yep. We have not been above the 200-day moving average since like 10 minutes in April, right? basically, but almost the whole year. We've been below. Right. Uh, 22 days out of 100 something or 200 something days. 
Uh, is that meaningful? Should we get excited about it? Or should we just say this is just one more data point and it's not its own story? And this is uh, how many days the S&P 500 has spent below its 200-day. Uh, so the longest, longest streak of under the 200 since, uh, since the GFC. Right. Yeah, which we could say it's since quantitative easing and balance sheet uh, manipulation, right? Look, uh, trend following is without question for anyone who wants to have a simplistic technique that makes money and controls risk, trend following is it. You know, this this idea of buying over sold conditions, selling over bought conditions, it's an illusion of control. It makes you feel good. makes you feel like you're, you know, in the action. But if you want to make money, consistently keep your blood pressure down, control your risks, trend following is important. Versus, like, pattern matching or yeah, fractals uh, or— uh, I mean, almost name anything. But what right? about intuition? <laughs> Yeah. Well, with the exception of intuition. <laughs> Trend following with a dose of intuition. <laughs> right. This time I'm not going to listen. All right. So so what you're talking about is the 200-day moving average, which is a way to smooth the noise of the day-to-day -day of the, the markets, right? I'll give you an interesting stat. Um, when we looked at individual names back to 1957 – and used a very simple technique, the 50-day moving average versus the 200-day moving average. So if the 50 days above the 200-day moving average, that's an uptrend. If it's below, it's a downtrend. Very simple. If you look at that and you measure the alpha, right? So we're trying to measure what the risk-adjusted returns for individual equities are um, in these two states. You find that in an uptrend, uh, stocks on a annualized basis – produce about 104 basis points of alpha. Not bad. I mean, you're not going to get on the cover if of Forbes. What? If you're buying it. If the trend is up, right? So today, the 50 days above the 200-day, tomorrow I own the name, and you just keep doing Scold that. Golden cross, death cross. It, yeah, exactly. Okay. So you're not going to get on the cover of Forbes. But, you know, look, it's, it's hard to generate alpha generally, but the uptrends generate more alpha. When the 50 days below the 200-day, it's actually negative 75 basis points. Yeah. So if you start looking at that spread of, you know, 180 basis points of alpha, that's real. Like, that's real over a period of time. So as a very simplistic measure, you can just say, I'm only going to own stocks in uptrends. You know, I can change the weight based on my fundamental values or whatever I, you know, however else I think about the world. But just by making that simple distinction, it really puts the odds in your favor. So the idea that the the, the market's above the 200-day, it's one trend-following technique. Sure. It's a little noisy, so we don't use it. It's part of a process, but it's not the, the main part of the process. Well, you want to know the slope, which is still negative. The slope is still negative. You want to know, like— is this for a day or a week or a month? Like how, like the duration of time it's been in an uptrend is meaningful, right? It, it is, yep. And then you also want to know thrust, right? So thrust is uh, what we call escape velocity, right? How, how powerful is this move? And there's different ways to measure that. Uh, a few of the ways that we look at it, what percentage of issues are above their own 20-day moving average, so very short term, you know, just a month basically worth of trading. What percentage of issues are making 20-day highs in any given day? Um, the 10-day the breadth, so if we measure breadth over a 10-day period, what does that look like? And I I'll tell you, and this is a true story, last night, you know, I, I, uh, I had to leave early. I came back, and, you know, obviously the market was strong, and it, it, it closed uh, on, a, on a firm note. And I started going through our internal work, and I – called my team together. I'm like, we got to double check this data because this doesn't look right to me. We had 17% of the names making 20-day highs. We had 72% uh, of names above their 20-day moving average. These are very low numbers for a market that was that strong and making a 20-day high. And what we found was that really when we went, this is on the Russell 3000, when we went through it, it was a bunch of mega cap names. It was names like you just pointed to, which are these beaten down names that had rallied back, didn't really make 20-day highs, had big consequential impacts on the market, NVIDIA, some of the FANG names, et cetera, yeah. but didn't change anything. The rallies in a downtrend. So wait, so, exactly. So, it was a rally so in a downtrend. Is, it fool, is this fool's gold? So it was, it was not, we did not get the escape velocity that we look for in those indications. Now that might still happen, but I would not, We're point, not there. To, I would not point to yesterday and say, thank God this is finally Isn't it. the reason, isn't one of the reasons why that those secondary measures of thrust are so important is that if you're just going by above below, you're going to churn up any of the alpha that might exist. Like, like th you would get so many false buy and sell signals. And when you're doing that with real capital and not just in a spreadsheet, like you could chew up an account. You absolutely can. So position sizing is important. The other part too is it's just psychological. Like I can give you a trading system that is right uh, only about 23% of the time. 
right? But it's, it sounds um, like you. But, <laughs> right? but when I do, when I hit, but I hit when it. You hit, it's no, big. <laughs> Jeff, I'm so glad you said that. Our our late friend John Borman used to say, if you want to buy a stock to to go up, buy one that's already going up. But right. behaviorally, it's counterintuitive. It, it goes is. against all of our instincts. We want to buy bargains. We'd rather people would rather buy a stock at a 52 week low than a 52 week high, even though we know empirically that is a bad strategy. Absolutely. But it's very difficult to buy a stock because you said, "Oh, I can't pay 100." It was 80 three months ago. But that's how There's momentum. so many things in there. There's like the just the idea that just generally it's better to buy things cheaper. Then there's like the uh, the anchoring bias, what price I last saw it at, right. or when the last time I owned it, what what it was trading. There's so much shit in there yeah. that is just not processed. And, but so maybe this is, this is cable. I didn't know this is cable. This oh, is, you can say okay. what you want. All right. Yeah, yeah. But buying <laughs> like I, within, we're not gonna. I know there's a, there's a big difference between buying <laughs> stocks that are cheap fundamentally yeah. versus you know if stock at 52 week low, it might still be expensive. But but when you're buying stocks that are in downtrends, like if you're expecting that to turn around in three months. You're, You're lucky, not good, if that happens. Right. Yeah. Usually, they make new lows. Right. Right. Well, and and it's a really important point because what we find is that we we're, you know, fundamentally, I'm a CFA charter holder. Fundamentally, I have a I have a value. Personally, I have a, just a, a philosophical value bias. Probably, you know, it's my Dutch heritage. Whatever. We'll see. Um, but what we find is that cheap stocks going down are not a good place to be. And again, very simply, we don't have to get sophisticated with these different algos. We can just use the 50-day versus the three, the, the, the uh, 200 day. If you buy cheap stocks in an uptrend, it's a far better proposition than thinking that somehow you found the magic and it's going to turn. Now, granted, there are special situations. There are you know hard book values, and they come along. There's no doubt about it. But consistently, to have that process, you absolutely should be buying cheap stocks only in uptrends. And that trade. So what about what about buying uh, expensive stocks and downtrends? Yeah, that, we like to do that. Uh, the, the trade of this year, obviously, and en- anything related to energy, these were cheap stocks and downtrends last year. Yeah. Sometime this year, they crossed over to becoming cheap stocks in uptrends, but a lot of money had already been made before they became a cheap stock going up. Or do I have that wrong? Uh, they so in our work. Um, I'm just thinking back. They changed right around the election. The the, oh, okay. the relative performance of energy changed around the election. And I remember very distinctly having a conversation with the clients who were saying, well, you know, the Biden administration is absolutely going to crush energy and this isn't going to work. And, it, and I'm like, I, you got it. That you shit know, never works. Ex- I'm like, you got you, you got to take a step back. But on, on both this, sides, right? it never yes, works. Exactly. Yeah. It, it has nothing to do with yeah. Biden. It has to do with politics. The, the politics yeah. just doesn't. You know, also, into also it. it's backwards. If you get somebody in office that wants to de-incentivize drilling, what do you think is going to happen to prices? Right, to those who can drill, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly. So, so anyway. So not only does that not work, even if it did work, it would work in the opposite direction. So an, an interesting stat, um, we go through every industry group and we look at what the best valuation technique is for that industry group, right? Now, I can tell you that for the market as a whole, free cash flow to enterprise value is a pretty good measure, right? But it doesn't apply to banks. It doesn't apply to utilities. There's yeah. a lot of industries that it doesn't apply to. So we go through and look at, okay, if I had you know, 50 years of data and said, in hindsight, what's the best one to measure? We do that for every industry group. With, without question, without fail, for energy – it's free cash flow to enterprise value. So it's it's pretty traditional. We had to rescale our charts back two years ago because <laughs> they, were so che- they were so cheap. Yeah. Wow. So we had to rescale the charts. And then we see that and the, we see the trend transition relatively. And I'm like, you, like what, yeah, what else yeah. can you, can you ask so for? So what I find so interesting is that you're even talking about things like enterprise value to free cash flow. Like, like, like that, 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 that that's even – something that goes into your your mix because so many technicians we talk to are pure technicians and they would argue, yeah, I'm sure that stuff's important, but the market is already aware of it. Well, I mean, look, I, 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 am, I am more in line with that than not, but I'm also an opportunist. And, you know, I don't care what makes me money as long as it's legal. I'm going to use that to my advantage, right? And so what we find historically, again, just from, from the data is that if I can find good uh, relative values that then have building momentum, it's, I mean, it's, it's a not, no-brainer. It doesn't have to be black or white. When the fundamentals and technicals line up, but you know, you get something. You have, but, you're, but you're talking to hedge funds who will not place a trade on technicals alone. They need yeah. to understand why the stock is working. 
And, and, so and you're able to deliver that to them. That's and, important. And we are. But but I would also say what we try to do as well is when they give us um, their portfolios, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know if they're short. I don't want to. I want to be very, very okay. unbiased and say, hey, this is a name that we would own. This is a name that we would short. And, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into, they're not arguments, but they'll, they'll try to convince me as to why that should, I'm like, I'm just looking at the day. Like, there's nothing for me. I can't change. I hear what you're saying, yeah. but I can't but change the chart. <laughs> right. I can't change the chart. So, you know, until your story is recognized, it doesn't matter, right? So it just doesn't matter. This yeah. year has been, I would guess the biggest spread between the Dow and the S&P since a one or two, like just not looking at the data, uh, off the top of my head, but for the last two months, it was the strongest. Uh, John, we have this. The strongest two month return for the Dow. And I'm not using rolling 30 day, I'm using actual monthly calendars. This is rolling two month returns for the Dow Jones Industrial Lab. Uh, was up 20%. So October and November were up 20% for the Dow, which is the strongest two month return since 1938. And John, if you zoom in to the next chart, we've got it uh, a little bit zoomed in. So yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Look at that. Definitely. The Dow um, is it's was, a little quirky of an index though. It's down three and a half percent. Right? Yeah, 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 of course. Well, it's yeah. it's uh, price, yeah, it goes to the other. Price way. Are yeah. you a Dow tr uh, Dow truther? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> like but, uh, S and P is the market. Stop talking about the Dow. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we, me, no, and you have this fight. It right is the market. The S P, of course, is the market. I think However, the Dow I mean, is the people's index. Is essentially, I mean, <laughs> wait, wait, in 1932. Okay, but <laughs> I'm a traditional guy. No, listen, uh, I I get I get all the arguments against looking at the Dow. Because a four hundred dollars stock is going to matter more than a hundred dollars. I get all that, but uh, the S and P and the Dow over like twenty year periods end up in the same place. Yeah, no, I, the that's path exactly might right. be different, but yeah. right. The returns, but, but aren't as that a representation, different. the question is: is it is it truly representative? Although, when okay. the people say, "What did the market do today?" They do ask for the Dow. That's what. Th yeah. Thank you. But you you agree with that? Well, of course. Yeah, of course. Imagine telling somebody, "Oh, what did the S and P do? It went up fifteen handles." Yeah. What? Yeah. What did, what did the Dow do? Yeah. I don't know. The people that shunned him on Sunday, I think they still look at the S&P. Listen. Peter <laughs> Tuckman is a huge S&P guy. <laughs> Tuckman knows what he's talking about, but most people haven't spent their career trading, you know, and, and don't really know. Um, all right. But do you think there's – so So is there a signal in, in the separation between the Dow and the S&P or the Dow and the NASDAQ? Is I, there something worth, like, remarking upon there? Well, the Dow and the NASDAQ um, – uh, that's growth versus value. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I honestly don't know. I have never looked at it. No, that's what, so. We know that twenty five percent of the S and P is Fang, and so it's a it's today, a value growth thing. But we'll see if it lasts, right? So that's you know that's the transition through time, and that's one of the things that you know I think is is um, underappreciated in this business is just the constituency of what the S and P looked like in say 1982, right? Where it was roughly 25% of the market was energy, yeah. right? And today it's, you know, uh, tech. And so people look at PEs for the market back in 1982 and say, well, it was so cheap. It's like, a different we, world. It's, it's a completely relevant. different world, yeah. right? It's a, it's, a, it's a completely different capitalization structure. You know, you got two guys and a dog starting a software company with no book value in a garage and, yeah. you know, you're trying to compare that to Exxon. By like, the way, just, Apple Ex still has like 30% gross margins or some ridiculous number. Yeah, exactly. Exxon got, right. got kicked out of the Dow at the bottom or close to the bottom. Yeah. Chevron's the only energy company in the Dow. I think that's right. I think that happened to Westinghouse too, though, but it still is a bottom. So, uh, all right. So, so the big picture, though, from your perspective is that we have not done enough to the upside. There's not enough of a thrust to really feel like the primary trend has changed. Yeah, so but we're, it's worth like keeping an eye on. Where, where we've been for the last three months, we have got a what we call our market cycle clock that looks at a bunch of different indications, which is essentially distilling it down to growth versus inflation. And you know what's what's um, amazing, and people don't believe it, but um, inflation and growth have been in the bottom third of this metric that we use uh, for the la which goes back over the last seventy years. They've been in the bottom third for about the last two months, right? So they're like, how in the heck can inflation be done? Yeah, well, I just I just turned we, my head right, what? right. You we, we we use PPI as one of the indications, and the reason that we do that is because the simplicity actually is a feature, not a bug. The simplicity of PPI is I call you and say, as the ISM, I call you and say, hey, your input costs are they higher, lower, about the same that they were last month? And you tell me, I'm like, okay, it's a diffusion index, and if it's above fifty, they're a little bit more. If it's below fifty, they're a little bit less. 
Well, you know, that seems like it's sort of, you know, ridiculously simple, but you don't have year over year problems that, that are presented from COVID. You don't have the change in the index that you get from CPI. And then we decide, you know, magically that we're going to exclude food and energy and all the, all these other things are just like hindsight bias related. Seasonal, this is, yeah, all this, the is, this is, this is, yeah, this is just pure data. Up or down. Yep. Pure data. And here it is. So okay. PPI is rolling over. It's, it's in the bottom third. Not only is it rolling over, it's in the bottom third of all the data back 70 years, right? This is an extraordinarily bullish zone for equities. So what, what do you make of the dollar having a really rough period, which is obviously a uh, tailwind that's, and, and interest rates coming down as well? So that's that the, the dollar is nothing more than a reflection of the stringent financial conditions that we had over the summer. It's interest rate differentials relative to Europe, Japan. That's, I mean, that's what the dollar There's is. There's four things that represent the dollar. There's interest rate differentials, growth differentials, um, purchasing power parity, and the what's called the international Fisher effect. You go back and look at them, all you need to know is the interest rate differentials. The other three account for maybe 2% of them each. Right. Right. So uh, you're absolutely right. So, so, we, so we started hiking first, and we hiked – Quick, and we hiked faster. And our expectations were continuing. And expectations. And that's the story of the dollar strength of 2023. Right. Okay. So, so the S&P over the last six months has been most sensitive to three things. Um, the, and I'll give them to you in order. Uh, the triple B spreads, right? Mm. So as they go up, S&P goes down. The dollar, as that goes up, the S&P goes down. And then nominal interest rates, which is basically the five-year you can use as a good proxy. As that goes up, the S&P goes down. So All those things have reversed in the last, what, month? This is weeks? this is the S&P on top and the dollar on the bottom. And they're mirror images. Yeah. It's not always like this, but this year it is. So what's interesting is, is people will always ask, well, what's the dollar's impact on the S&P? And that's a reasonable question. But is if you go backwards? back and look, it absolutely is backwards, right? The dollar is a reflection of financial conditions. And so when we go back and look at attribution, today it's about 10%. So it's actually extraordinarily high. At 10% today, that's extraordinarily high. It's usually right around 1% to 2%. Which is so, noise, right? I mean, it's complete noise. Yeah. So when people get all worked up about the dollar trade, I'm like, seriously? Like, we're, we're dealing about 2% of what this, we're But we're this year, like, it's incredible yeah. the degree to which – S and P futures will move lower well, because this is a, it's a different year, different environment. But because it's a reflection of those financial conditions, right? So it's you know you sort of have to ask: Is this is it the dollar or is it the dollar representing what the financial? What conditions? probability? I think the would dollar you, is what the S and P sees in the mirror. So I think it's stocks that are driving the dollar, or, or just general. Sentiment. What probability would you place on the dollar having topped for the cycle in September? I'd say close to seventy percent. Yeah, and one of the interesting things so we we monitor the uh, the CFTC positioning within the futures market, right? And um, and again, it's you know this is one of those things. You're where, a perfect guy. Sorry to cut you off. You're a perfect man to answer this question. Who are these commercial hedgers? <laughs> like I mean, seriously, it's Fortune 500 companies that have real costs in yeah. the real economy. That, that's who they are. That's for the, the S and P or for what? Uh, it depends on what you're we're talking looking about. At, no, for well, commodities, gold right? miners. Is that what you're asking? So remember Brian Basket was here and we we're talking about like these commercial hedgers. Oh, dude, Colgate Palmolive, you know how much you know how much chemicals they and, and 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 raw materials they have to buy to make everything that they make? They would hire a firm to do hedging for them. Yeah, I know you're Chicago. a chemist, take it easy. No, right? <laughs> but but right? Like that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Oil I mean, companies. Kellogg's for cornflakes, Air, right? Airlines, yeah. for, airlines jet for jet fuel. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the S&P, it's pension funds. It's It can be mutual funds. It can be trading desks, right? They're they're taking on, they're expanding their book and their balance sheet, and they want to offset that. So, you know, there's there's some of that. But, what's but is, there signal, is there a signal in these numbers? Well, sometimes there are, sometimes there's not, right? So um, with the dollar, what's interesting is most people would say, well, whatever the commercial hedgers are doing, I want to do, right? That's the quote unquote smart money. Let's make sure that we're following the commercial hedgers. That doesn't always prove to be true. And in fact, with the dollar, what's interesting is when commercial hedgers become excessively net long the dollar, right? So in other words, they're hedging against a dollar rising. It's almost a perfect point to be selling because they finally gotten their act together where they're saying, you know what, whether it's the CFO, the treasurer, or whatever, they're saying, we don't want this representing us poorly in the earnings the next quarter or the next two quarters, right. let's put on the hedge so now. So they're like the dumb money? They're, kind of? they're, so they essentially end up being, for the dollar, right. just for the dollar, they end up being the dumb money. So you actually want to fade the commercials in that instance, where as something like what we're seeing in, say, NDX futures, they're actually long, and they've been getting long, and they're actually, for the first time in this bear market, they got long about a week, maybe two weeks ago now. But who would be the commercial hedges of the NASDAQ 100? Uh, it could be pension funds that know that they're going to get allocations, that they don't have enough uh, cash positions, so they're using futures to offset that and, and shore themselves up. Um, it could be mutual funds that have seen outflows 
and they want to offset that could be you know there's there's anybody who's trafficking in the underlying and un, uh, uncomfortable with their in this case short position or underweight position in equities or in uh, Nasdaq futures would be using that. Well, the how, dollar is dropping like a stone again today. How how important is monitoring uh, what the commercial hedgers are doing? Like in other words. Is that a strong enough signal if it's at an extreme that it would overturn something that you're seeing in price? Or do they very rarely contradict each other? So th this gets into something that we talk about a lot, which is we look at the markets in two distinct buckets. Um, the first one, I'll try to keep this simple. The first one is what we call potential energy. You're a chemist, so you know potential energy, right? That's Sitting right. there, it's just waiting to be unlocked, right? So that's sentiment. That's valuation. It's something that it's inert right now, but it has the potential to be very, very powerful. Mm. And then we look at what we call kinetic energy or what physicists call kinetic energy. And that would be something like momentum, trend, that hot spark that can then use that fuel to push the market higher, right? So one without the other, yeah, it's just not that interesting. Both together, very, very powerful. So when we look at something like sentiment, when we look at valuation, we look at it exactly in the same light where we say, look, the potential energy, uh, and one of the reasons why we've been more optimistic over the last three months, frankly, tactically bullish, not long-term bullish, but tactically bullish, is because the sentiment positioning was offsides. The seasonality, we said this is just the time of year that this stuff happens. Yeah. Um, the market cycle clock was saying that, that people are, are offsides in terms of their thinking about what's likely to happen to policy. And so what you can end up happening or what, what ends up happening is you just fill that void, right? People are offsides. And it's not that anything necessarily changes, but just it's not as bad as what people were yeah. expecting. And you it's just like go back to trend. Unwind. Exactly. So you just go back to trend, which yeah, is what yeah. you're talking about, going back to the 200-day moving average. And without that thrust, without that, the, the percentage of issues over the 20-day, the 20-day highs, all those things we talked about, it's really hard for us to then say, okay, well, this is a new bull market. This is just sort of filling that void that existed that nobody could it's see the light of day. It's more neutral than it is breakaway or Correct. breakout. Right. Okay. Right. So let's, let's, we spent a lot of time talking about equities. Let's talk about credit a little bit. Uh, there was a huge outflow from LQD, which is the iShares investment grade ETF. And when I saw this headline, I thought to myself, huh, 10% of the fund leaving in one day has to be like a model that's port. A, that's a big RIA who got a better deal from State Street than BlackRock. It, it has to, or, this has to be a model, or vice this has to be a model portfolio <laughs> shift. There's, there's literally – It's a basis point trade. There's no other explanation. <laughs> and then later in the week, sure enough, the journal did a piece – showing all of the fund flows coming into high-yield ETFs. This literally was like three days later. I was like, huh, nailed it. Um, but as we look at, Jeff, as you look at- uh, Oh, so you're saying that's somebody saying, get me out of LQD, get me into JNK. Maybe it was just taxes harvesting. Who, who knows what it could be? Right, but right. but this chart shows flows coming in. So the LQD was, was probably just a model portfolio change. As we think about uh, investment grade spreads, where do you think we are in this cycle? Is it weird that there's been- not so much stress on credit or like, what do we make of all that? The, the thing the, is all the junk bonds are energy companies. No, these, they've, never they, been no, no, no. they've never made more money. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at next chart, please. John, uh, uh, John, this is, in, this is investment grade spreads. Yeah. I mean, it's, where's, in, the, where's the spike? I think it's in the top 80th percentile. I think if you look at all that data, I think we're in that top 80th percentile. So it's not the 90th, it's not the hundredth, right? So there's, 20% more but, to go. Yeah. yeah. So it's elevated, but we're also not in recession, right? So I think that's sort of where you are. Um, look, I don't think we're going back to 2008, 2009. We just don't have that, you know, that same underlying dynamic. And, you know, one thing that's interesting about this business is people love to fight the last war, right? Yeah. So the last thing that's on their mind is like, oh, my God, this is, you know, the housing crisis or whatever. I'm like, eh, probably not because – Policymakers put in these gates and other thing else that sort of helps prevent that. What's interesting, though, is those gates generally help to build some other problem or dislocation in the market that you have to be, you know, you have to be ready for. I, I never know what it is. You just have to be yeah, on guard right. For but it. if you're worried about banks and mortgages, you're thinking about the wrong thing. Correct. Right. Because right. because yeah. we did that already. Yeah. Capital and ratios, everything else is it's going to be right. It's going to it's not going to be the thing that everyone is looking at because they remember ten years ago. Right. Okay. The the old saying that you know. The shot that gets you is the one you don't see coming. Well, it's that's why it gets you for a reason, right? So it's so. But even if you look, trickier. even if you look outside of junk bond, like if you just look at like credit default swap. There's like no sign of anything. Very little. Very yeah. little. There's some. There's some credit intra, card charge offs or tiny. some intra bank stress. You know, between European banks and there's some. You know, there's some funkiness going on with that. But even that's calmed down here recently. So we um, talked about credit. We talked about credit Swiss just now uh, before the show. 
Michael and I did like a whole segment on it on YouTube the other night. I can't get excited about it. I feel like I don't know if the equity is worth anything or not. Like I, I feel like it doesn't matter. It's not as systemic as it sounds like it is. Like I, it's not, it's not the Swiss government and they're probably not going to let it completely fail anyway. And they'll just keep diluting shareholders and then they'll do a reverse split and it'll be a $30 stock like they did with Citi and life will go on. Yeah. Like if that's the big risk that we're, is Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse, I can't get excited about that. Right, at a, at a perpetual ROE of six. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, I know. No, I just right. feel like they'll just like yeah. keep paying fines and they'll reverse split the stock and who cares. So I, I don't see any sign of like that that credit blow up. And that's what they want you to think. No, but like <laughs> nobody nobody can really come up with a story where there's some sort of like imminent yeah, it's credit the, It's crisis. the hole in the balance sheet, right? That's the That was the big thing. Is it like how big is the hole in the balance sheet that do we not know, right? Right. And then you have the counterparty. So the counterparty stuff becomes an issue because if, you know, I don't trust you and now you, because of him, you don't trust me. And He doesn't you know, trust Peter we'll, we'll Tuckman. See, right. We're going to F, uh, poor Peter. <laughs> FTX and Jeff, you, know, you have the whole you, thing. you had this interesting observation about the relative attractiveness of of uh, fixed income versus versus stocks. Earlier in the year at one point, like stocks, the S&P and the ag were both down 15% year to date. Yeah. And uh, you're saying that bonds are actually more relatively more attractive even after the decline than stocks are. Right. So one of the ways that we look at the world, we talked about the free cash flow to enterprise value, right? And we do it for individual companies um, within the within the index. So when we go back and compare where our valuation indicator is in 1982, it's exactly the same calculation and on an apples to apples basis as it is today, right? So we can actually compare through time. Um, we What we found was that the best valuation um, normalizer, right? Some people use GDP or you can use all these, but the best valuation normalizer is not the treasuries because, you know, that's the, that's the cost that the government, the, you know, risk-free rate essentially other than interest rate risk can borrow at. What we found is that the best proxy is triple B government bond yields, right? Not the spreads, but the yields. And what we find today is that because we've had the bear market in bonds, we've had a bear market in equities, um, that's a pretty unusual occurrence over the last 40 years. And so usually what's happening is you get a bear market in equities that raises your free cash flow yield. Um, the Fed cuts rates, so you get a bond rally that lowers yields, and that differential starts to widen, and there's a value proposition for equities, right? So bonds rally, equities look cheap, and sooner or later that gets some traction. Today, we've had just the opposite, or actually uh, uniqueness, in that the bond market has sold off the yields of those bonds are high. More attractive. Right, more attractive. As equities have sold off, and they actually, the yields of equities haven't kept up with the bonds. So when we look at it, we're actually looking at it saying, today, dollar for dollar, I've got more attractive offers in the bond market than I do in the equity market. You know how many, you know how many equities are like disqualified if the one year is going to be 5% yield? Like, you know how much of the stock market you just throw in the garbage? Yeah, well, know. that's where we are. I, I mean, that's where we are. Yeah. So, And I think that's going to be a big problem as we go forward, right? We're yeah. going to have to, like, the, the the one thing, I'm not I'm not convinced that, you know, rates are going to 10% or something crazy, but I am convinced that we've broken the, the, the bull market in bonds that was in place for my entire career. You would say that that years. ended last year? I would say that ended last year. Okay. Now, I would not say that that downtrend immediately turns to uptrend, but generally downtrends go into a basing period yeah. and then you can start the uptrend. Wouldn't and I it think make sense if that ended last year, like poetically, like we had negative yield, we had how 10 many tr trillions, $10 trillion worth of negative yielding debt after the pandemic. And that was the bottom. Yeah, sure. That was the end of a 40 year. It had to end at negative. It was such a powerful. Just like energy with well, negative crude, right? I mean, can, 100%. You, can you imagine the, you know, the idea? I know the story doesn't have to be good, but that's a really good story for why a 40 year bond bull market would end. That it ended with negative bond yields. Well, and and I would add to that, it, it almost ended with hubris too, right? We can do whatever we want yeah, because we, that's great we've controlled too. we've controlled this for so long. Yeah. And you know, we've got we've got the bond market in our back pocket and we don't have anything to worry we about. We invented nine trillion dollars between fiscal stimulus with money we didn't have and newly printed dollars into yeah. the system. Yeah. So that right. So that would also line up really well with that having been the end. Yeah. We learned that actually 
when nobody has to go to work and everyone has cash, it's not a great idea. Yeah. So um, this is you, right? Yields and oil? Yes, it's him. All right, let's go into this. This is really interesting to me. John, can you throw up this U.S. 10-year yield? There it is. I want to I wanna read what you wrote and then have you react to it. Yields and oil are two of the most consistent counter-cyclical indicators historically, i.e. higher yields and higher oil sow the seeds to lower yields and lower oil. Here we measure the three-year rolling sharp ratio, norm, which normalizes returns for volatility. On yields, that's the inverse of bond prices, you'll note that we're in the top 2.5% historically, which is usually the point at which the rubber meets the proverbial road and the tipping point of financial conditions, thus lower yields. So tell me, tell me why that's relevant to uh, asset allocators or investors. Like what's, what's the message behind that? Well, there's, there's a couple. One is that the returns have been so bad in the bond market and they're matching, you know, things that we saw back in the mid aughts. And then, you know, taking that back a little further close to the 1980s. And usually those returns are just unsustainable, you know, both on the good side and the bad side. Right. So, um, you, you're never as smart as you think you are, and you're probably not as dumb as you think you are, though that one might yeah. be debatable, right? Yeah. It's so, the worst year for Treasury since 1788. Yeah. So I can't cont- that can't persist. Well, and 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 part of what's you know the magic of the bond market, right, is that when you put yields out there at seven percent, well, guess what happens? Buyers. They're just well, there's buyers, but those that are borrowing are done. Mm. Right. I can't. This capital project doesn't make any sense right. at seven yeah. percent, right? So you don't borrow. Right, and so all of a sudden, demand goes away. That sows the seeds for lower rates to start to attract that back. That just happened with mortgages. Absolutely, I mean, mortgages are, are you know, they're very simple, and housing is very simple, and and it's actually a very good proxy and a nice sort of one hundred and one economic tutorial about how that works. It just froze the market. Because guess what happens? Can't afford to move, and prices are more. Inelastic. Case Shiller is off a Case Shiller home prices now off a cliff and activity. Home sales are is at like half century lows. Like just ho- like yeah, home sales contracts. are collapsing, like obviously. That. Yeah. Like, like that. that. It did it, it it took eight months of rising. Although weights. interestingly because, well, because yeah. the, the prices won't change, right? So if you adjusted the home the price, prices. Right. Mm-hmm. If you adjusted prices so that my payment looks the same. People, that's yeah. glacial. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. That process that's where, exactly where homeowners right. say I guess I'll sell 20% lower than yeah, last yeah, year. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, mortgage rates came in a little bit. They're at yeah. like six and a half. I do wonder how quickly the activity picks back up if we get down to six or well, so. Well, so our economist, Neil Dutta, has a great chart on this, and it actually picked up pretty meaningfully in terms of application. In the Just last with week? that 50 basis point, yeah. I think it was the last three weeks, okay. they've come down. And I could see refis was, picking, was, I like could see amazing. refis being slower, but like home sales picking back up. It's like yeah, nobody's no, refining six and a half percent. If you didn't do it in the last three That's years, right. you're not doing it. So the here. refi market might be dead for like years. Yeah, but I could see home sales reacting relatively quickly because people still have to live somewhere. I hope you like your house. Is really what that well, comes down to. Right? That goes without saying. You're there. Uh, let me continue with this. Well, what did you want to say about oil there? Because that's the same kind of thing, right? If if returns in the oil market are low, ultimately that will lead to less drilling. Are, which has to lead to higher prices. There are two very, for the market, for, for equities, right? That's what we focus on. There are two very consistent um, uh, counter-cyclical inputs. Uh, rates, mostly short rates, not even long rates, mostly short rates and oil. And those two things, you can build a very accurate GDP model using those two inputs. And we can make it more sophisticated and, a lot, and we'll get a little bit more incremental information out of it. But honestly, by the time you, you distill it back down to what are these two inputs really telling us? Those two things will. What's give you more important, the 70%. level or the direction? Uh, that's a good question. It's what we fo- we have what we call our yield impact model, and believe it or not, it is. It, and we tested this. Say direction. It's, no, it's hmm. it's fifty fifty. Interesting. It's split. Um, what what I thought was most interesting is that the market for equities, the market couldn't care less about what the level of rates are, anything further back than three years ago. So if you're going to tell me, oh, rates were whatever in 19, 2016, market doesn't care. Market market has moved on. They care about the level today versus what the higher low was over the last three years. And anything longer than that, it's irrelevant. I did this very simple analysis looking at, I think it was, I can't remember if it was inflation or interest rates. But if, if inflation was lower than it was a year ago, that was massively positive for stocks. 
And if it was higher, like it was a bit way bigger spread than regardless of where, what level, just the fact that it was lower or higher. The rolling 12 month return, this is probably wrong, but it's directionally right, was like 11% when inflation was lower than a year before and like 3% when it was higher, something like that. The market cares about better or worse, not good or bad. And that, that is lost that, Do you feel the same way when you look at price charts and people talking about, oh, this was resistance back in 2004? Totally. Bullshit, it, right? Yeah, Thank you. No, well, that's 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 your argument. Thank you. Right. Now you can you can use volume, right? How is that memory? Twenty years no, ago, there's no, no buyers. There's no, 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 people. But, but what if Correct. a stock hits the same level five times in a twenty year period? There's that's got, d- that's different. That can't be coincidence either. Well, I mean, it depends on. I agree with that, but it depends on. Are we talking about? Five years as of you know 2000 to 2010, yeah, yeah, yeah. or we're talking about five years starting in 2010 all the way up to today. That that's more interesting. And more a lot relevant. of because a lot of people are looking at. Uh, I remember this distinctly. A lot of people it in is. like 17 or 18 were looking at the Nasdaq breaking above Dude, your that's 2000 so f- highs. Josh, it's so funny to say that. That's what I got. Come on, this this is not. There's no. Pi- I understand that price stopped here. There's no memory here. These are these people are washed yeah, out. They're it, dead. Like, price, well, but price also, did stop though. It did. Okay, fine. But keep in mind. Those companies, I think, different I, stocks. Yeah, as I say, I think it's only like thirty percent. Well, Cisco, other Microsoft, thing. Right. and Intel, uh, whatever. There's, yeah, are, there's a few. People but. are charting uh, Arc. Her portfolio has one stock in common. Yeah, she could be a utility fund tomorrow, and it, yeah, two years ago it. it was it was twenty percent Tesla. Now it's six percent right, Tesla. Settled, yeah. settled what are then. we looking at? Right. right. Um, let's do this drawdown from uh, SPX and Treasury over the last sixty years. And then the combined 60-40, that's a 60-40 portfolio. Yeah, why, why would anybody put gray on blue? That's so dumb. So you're saying here, bonds usually insulate portfolio returns. Today, they've exacerbated the drawdown. Yes, thank you for that. We know. <laughs> right, <laughs> We're an RIA, right. we know. Um, worse for risk parity, which actually levers bond positions. Yeah, not only did bonds of not help, volatility. they caused the downside. They yeah, made it worse. Right, right. So what what well, should the, we take away from this? The, and this was the point of that valuation argument I was making towards bonds before, right? Where where this this created a drawdown that was not insulated by the bond market. And the drawdown actually has made bonds relatively more attractive okay. the, to stocks, right? Still. So, still. What, right. When would that change? Well, yields come down? Uh, or, yeah, yields come down um, or the equity markets the come down a lot is already, more, right? So, the 10-year is already falling off a cliff. What's yeah. it, 3.7? So, so that's, that's three, it's 3.5. 3.5. Wow. 3.58 wow, or something wow, wow. I saw it. You know? So that's getting less attractive by the day. Yeah, so that's helping, right? Okay. Um, but it's not, you know, if, you, if you're to keep things static, you got to be careful because you're, you're using two different inputs that can, that can move here. Um, but it's somewhere around 3,500, just below 3,500 that it starts looking interesting for equities around these levels. For, for we're, we're talking specifically for corporates, right? So that's, we're more interested in investment grade corporates than treasury. Now you said that corporate credit is more attractive from a valuation perspective than corporate equities, than stocks. That's the next chart. For 2023. All right, right. let's get into that. John, you have that? This is you. What's interesting about this bear market and unique to the last 40 years of bear markets is the lack of value proposition offered by equities. We just did this. Right. No, but but, but this, I want to see it. I want to see This is the chart itself. So when you're above that green line, right, that means you're in the 90th percentile of that differential, which means that the free cash flow for equities is in the 90th percentile versus – the spread versus triple. Meaning stocks are attractive. Yes, stocks are attractive. We're in the bottom 10th percentile. And what you'll note is not today specifically, but where we are most recently is we're actually below where we were at the beginning of 2021. How, could that, how could that be? It's because the bonds have gotten shellacked. So purely on that basis, we're less attractive now than we From were. From a valuation perspective. Yeah. That's wild. Yep. I don't think most people are considering that. Nope. And they should be because but every dollar could be allocated anywhere. Absolutely. that's a, If you're making a rational decision and you're looking at this historically, you're saying my dollar return, if I'm a steward of capital, right, this dollar's return should be going to this asset, not that asset. So said differently, it almost never makes sense to downshift a portfolio after a bear market. In other words, to go from 70-30 down to 60-40 because you got out over your skis, you're scared or whatever. Now it does. This is the first time in 40 years that we've seen that make sense. Yeah. Very wow. Odd. That's very interesting. Um, let's do this Vanguard thing. We, you want to set this up? Well, yeah. I also want to talk about the yield curve. We'll, we'll put a pin in the yield curve, but the two year is falling too, but it's four, two, three. And the 10 years, what did we Not say? Three, five? This fast. Unbelievable. But isn't that? We'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. But that's the, that's, that's the market, the bond market saying 
whatever additional rate cut uh, rate hikes the Fed thinks it's going to do are going to be given back Sir, very quickly. We're putting a pin in that. All right, fine. We, will, we will come back to that. Fine. Uh, before we get back, I like, before, when you, but, I like when you take control of the show. Bef- every once before while, we take the, the pin out, we're going to talk about uh, just Vanguard real quick. Had this uh, paper. I was about to call it press release. I'm not sure why. Uh, a blog post. I don't know what you call this. Vanguard investor pulse. It was, uh, TikTok. An- anxiety and cash needs on the rise. And they have one chart in here that is very interesting. They're looking at, I guess, uh, uh, Vanguard buy, buy households. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're looking at here is a household's needs for cash is especially evident in all-time highs for hardship and withdrawals. So they break it down like people taking money out of their account. This what, is 401k participants who are taking money out. So this is a noisy chart, but what you need to know is this. As I say, I always try to make charts, you know, is, simple. Yeah, but it's incredibly I, noisy. If I swallow my tongue over here, somebody help me, okay? It is incredibly noisy, but what we, what we, what we, the thing to focus on is the orange line, which is hardship withdrawals, which is at as high a level as they started taking. What is data. a hardship withdrawal? You have to actually give a reason for why you're taking the money out and should not pay a tax on it. Is, the, is that the... You have to meet a certain standard for an actual Well, because you, you have to pay a penalty and income tax on this. So I don't know. You can't do a hardship withdrawal and wire it to Coinbase. Like you have to have a reason. Don't you get 60 days and then you have to they change you that law? You have to put it back. But you have to You're put like it borrowing back. money from yourself basically. Right. But if you put it back in 60 days, I thought you used to be able to do that tax-free. So you That's could, not, you but could the IRA rules and Coinbase. the 401k rules not, might not be the same. Right. It's a 401, this is 401k. This right. is 401k. Okay. Well, that's, uh, th- that was that where that rule applied. So this is this five. Is. They they surveyed two thousand Vanguard investors on their outlook for the stock market. Uh, that's different. So, but uh, whatever. Again, no, it's noisy. But the point is this: people are tapping their four hundred one k. This is it's not a good thing. This is supposed to be your retirement money. We know that. Uh, we know that credit card usage is up fifteen percent in the third quarter versus last year, and we got data today about. The uh, the cash that's in bank accounts and uh, all, all of those things are trending lower, mm. which arguably is great because people will go back to work. Is that the way to think about that? Well, I'd think about it as the Fed sees it and says, hey, we've got a potential problem on our hands, right? And so, so that we've too. done enough and here we can start to – But you want people to feel like they burden. need to be working and well, not yeah. feel like I'm going to sit home and and – you need the labor force participation to tick up. From an equity market perspective, I look at that and say, okay, well, if people are taking hardship withdrawals, it means they've already liquidated whatever yes. whatever cash they or assets they've had that they can access, right, to whatever it is, make credit card payments or whatever. So, again, those weak hands or the marginal buyer has probably, for the most part, taken themselves out of position to be a seller going forward, which is good news. Uh, John, put that up one more time. What was what was the hardship in 08 or 09? I don't know if I don't it, think was, it went back that far. Yeah. Oh, we don't have it doesn't go back but that there's, far. But there's there's all the noise on that chart, the one thing I noticed. Oh, it's right in front of me. It does go back but that every, far. Every, it? But everything is noisy because it's for example, low. for example, Ben Kassman tweeted today, the continued strength of real consumer spending is pretty remarkable, accelerating over the past few months as inflation has eased. I don't have this chart up there, but but Jeff, check, take a look at this. Inflation adjusted consumer spending looks to be accelerating again. again. Yeah. So you could easily paint a very bleak picture of the consumer or that they're getting to the end of their rope, all of the excess savings. Honestly, they're just like buying airline tickets, it seems. And then like you, could, only- you could show and listen to a lot of <laughs> have companies. Flown, have cars. you flown recently? I've, I try not to, yes. Holy shit. I know. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like it. Any flight, any destination. Where where did I – I was just on a plane. Oh, when I went to Vegas. It was insane. There's people laying in the aisles. <laughs> well, that is no, that's kind of what you get. In ja- no, no, no. no just in you're the going to Vegas. Oh, I uh, see. Just you're in the airport. Saying, okay. Just in the airport. Got it. But no, it looks like one of those scenes where like there's like somebody on a bus like in Latin America and there's like a chicken and a go- – like it's like <laughs> every single flight is full. Livestock. Beyond – yeah. Right. Beyond people fighting over the overhead compartments like fist fights. All right. Uh, let's take the pin out and – Talk about the yield curve. So Bullard said the other day, uh, expected disinflation is the party driving yield curve inversion. So it is not necessarily sending a recessionary signal. I would love to hear your take on the yield curve. Uh, is it? Is it? Uh, it's one of the most reliable indicators. The last nine times it inverted, a recession followed. Uh, what's going on here? Well, I mean, it has changed, right? When I got in the business back in the late 1980s, um, the statistical significance of the 10-year to the two-year was 
meaningful. You know, T stat of three, all that stuff. Is, well, he uses uh, Campbell Harvey's like three month, ten year, but same directionally, so, same thing. Interestingly, right? Yeah. Since since the nineties, this has been trend. The efficacy has been trending down, right? And it's actually today, it's meaningless. Like today, the yield curve has no impact statistically on the returns of the equity market, which I think, still find hard to believe. Do you think because the economy is less sensitive to it or because everybody knows no, about it? No, because the absolute level of rates are so low. Well, I think there's part of that. But the also, also, think about what's happened in the last 20 years, right? We've introduced this thing called forward guidance and expectations from the Fed. So the two-year now reflects what those expectations are. If you go back and we look at what's had the most stable statistical significance over that period of time, it's actually the 10-year to the Fed funds. So not what the Fed's saying, but what the Fed's doing. And if you look at that spread, that one still has efficacy, right? So what we're seeing is that the, the market is pricing out what the Fed's saying they think they're going to be doing. And what that really gets back to But that's is, inverted too, no? Well, they both are inverted. The, 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 the last one inverted like within the last month, so the last – the last rate two weeks hike, ago. Right? Yeah, two weeks ago. So what that really gets back to in, in our view is that the Fed, and I, I I am not a Fed hater. I mean, I know people are out there and, and they've got a hard job. There's no doubt about it. What I do think one of the mistakes that they make is they're overconfident in their ability to predict the future. I mean, anybody who thinks they're good at predicting the future is going to be overconfident. Very confident in my assertion. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's Ben Carlson, who is a Fed apologist, they're, they're, I should point out. They, they are very – uh, they're overconfident in their ability to predict the future, and they're underappreciative of the power that they have to impact the economy, right? So they sit here and say, we think things are going to be somewhere in six months, and the stuff that we've done, you know, we have to let it catch up. We have to, they have no idea what – None. They're what they've you know what they've done back here and how that's going to impact. So they've got a massive point. wake behind them that they don't see. Dude, the, yeah. in September of last of year, balanced. they yeah. saw no rate hikes this year, or one. Yeah. It's, it's like completely ridiculous to go by their guidance. It's not that they're dumb. It's that just things are really tough to predict. It's it's hard to predict yeah. the future. No doubt about it. No matter, yeah. you know, how many econometrics you have, et cetera. So here's that T-stat, that, that, the bottom pane, right? So this is the 10s versus 2s. So the T-stat is essentially a, a, a statistical tool that you see if there's a significant relationship between two variables, right? In this case, it's the S&P and the two-year to 10-year. To um, as that red line basically dips below two in the bottom pane, it says that you're losing the efficacy of this predicting the S&P. Right now, we're, we're not only are we, you know, below zero, which is negative, so the, the signs flipped, right? So what used to be good is now bad, right? Um, and so I still think that there's something here, but we have transitioned because, you when know— When did forward guidance start Bernanke, right? Yeah. Post-crisis? Uh, really, they started talking about implementing it in 2004. So this, is when he, Dodd, this is Dodd Plotz and yeah, – when he became the softer, gentler – But Fed he chair. started – the press conferences started during the financial crisis mm -hmm. under Correct. under him. Yes. And Janet continued it. And now it's just like a thing. They yeah. never did this shit before. No. I mean when I got in the business, there used to be a whole cottage industry of people that would Queens go band. through and, and look at – this is before that. This is Volcker where, where they go through and say – we can only tell what the Fed did six weeks ago by going through the balance sheet and and analyzing. Oh, that's what, interesting. What the? I mean, so not only did they not give you forward guidance, they didn't even tell you what they, they did. They give you backward the guidance. Way, they didn't give you backward <laughs> guidance. So, so, do you, so like it was you know it's a completely different world. So the market expectations are moving prices such that there is less and less value to looking at a yield curve because the yield curve is now anticipating rather than reacting to conditions. That's. That is our premise, yes. Okay, that's yes. interesting. Because it has changed. One of the overly simplistic explanations of why an inverted yield curve might cause a recession is people talking about the banks borrowing long, uh, borrowing short, lending long. And why would they and do that at all? Is loss? that complete nonsense? Yeah, that's really changed in the last several years, yeah. what? Which part? The borrowing short and long. Oh, that's, got, that's they're, my they're question. Access to capital is does the yield today. curve – do something to the economy, or does it just reflect something that the economy is doing to it? The yield curve generally reflects – because people are very sensitive to short rates, right? Credit cards, yeah. um, uh, auto loans. Mortgages. So, yeah, mortgages to a lesser extent because you're usually locked in. But but today what I'm going to do is going to you know have some impact on that. So um, – the the inversion just tends to you know float around what that more stable historically stable level is. Um, the the yield curve 
is actually a really good indication of what you want to do in fixed income, right? When it's inverted, you actually want to extend duration. It, 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 it tries to fool you into doing the wrong thing. Wait, why, why do you want to extend? Because if you think about it, if I'm at 4%, let's just use raw numbers. I'm at 4% today in a two-year yield, right? And I'm at 3.5% on a 10-year yield. I'm thinking, what fool would buy a 10-year yield when I can get a 50 basis point pickup We had this conversation two, two hours yeah, so ago. Please the answer prob- Well, the problem is, is that as you get out in two years, the likelihood is that 4% yield, you're not going to be rolling at two, or you're going to be rolling at one and a half. Because oh, in the 10-year, you won't have the, to roll. In the 10-year, you're sitting Ooh. there saying, hey, guess what? I'm Yeah, nobody, that's very counterintuitive. So, when, so in buying the 10, you're taking a lower yield today, but without the risk of having to roll it at an even lower price sooner. Correct. You're, you're actually in a position of strength as a bond market investor. That's interesting. By buying the long end of the curve when it's inverted. Hmm. You want to buy the short end when it's when it's steepening and the, ri- the yeah. risk, the risk of rolling is a real risk. Correct. It's Absolutely. not even a that risk. Is, it's that, a certainty that you're going to have. This to. is like a freak show of a yield curve. I don't even know what that is. What is that? This is the yield curve. It's just very unusual. Uh, oh, 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 I see what you're saying. So that's this, the 30 year out there. And it's, yeah, the belly of the curve is where you want to be right now. Let's do this thing on what, what buybacks. Sevens or tens or fifteens? Uh, five to 10. Five to 10. Uh, John, Yuri and Timmer's tweet, if you please. Share buybacks played a huge role in the market this year. Without them, the bear might have been meaner. I've been saying this, but I never had the data to actually back it up. Buybacks are holding up at 6.8% of revenue, which are making new all time highs. So far, so good, but we may have reached the peak for this cycle. There was a lot of firepower from all the refinancings and all the just high high profit margins for years on end. And thank God, because ha- like large companies like Apple were able to keep their share price relatively stable in a pretty unstable market environment. Do you think that that's been as big a factor as uh, Timur seems to believe or – Overstated, understated? Uh, I mean, most of the work that we've done shows that the the rates of the previous year drive the buybacks for the next year, right? Because you change your capital structure. The rates of what? Interest the, rates. Right. Okay. So I go through and I, I either roll my debt or I issue new debt and I change the capital structure of my company. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm rewarded doing that. If I can get corporate debt at 3 or 4%, my cost of equity is 8 or 10%. I mean, that makes all the sense in the world, Right. So that'll be interesting to see. Well, th- so, right. So if that's the case, then of course buybacks will be lower next year. Right. So it's it's been a one way street. So we don't really have the other side of that to to mm. test the hypothesis against. But that would be that's where we're coming down on it. Is so what will companies do instead? Is there an incentive to pay a higher dividend yield, or I mean, you will got they just to, have less money to work with? There's there's a couple things, right? Well, if you're if you're making the money, then yeah. then you, you have to. You have to either reinvest in the business if you think it's a good return on invested capital or you return to shareholders. Okay. And so that's, you know, through buybacks or dividends. But if the dividend yield, or I'm sorry, if the buybacks um, are being you know, financed with borrowed money, then, then it's that different. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Then you, you increase your dividend yield. That's interesting. I don't know that the buyback ETFs or the shareholder yield ETFs have, uh, I don't know that there's a difference in the way they calculate those for companies that are doing buybacks financed by cheap debt versus companies that are doing yeah, I don't know buybacks that. out of cash flow. That might be a trading opportunity for next year, one versus the other. You know, what I will say in my 30 plus years in the street is, man, are things trendy. It's amazing how trendy things are. So as as in vogue as buybacks were, you know, I could ease in, in you know, how out of favor dividends were, I could easily see where that starts to shift again, just as a, you know, whether it's in a, a, a to create more income, to make them more interesting. I mean, we don't look at it that way because we just look at the free cash flow, which is what you're left with anyway. Um, but you, you could see some of these tricks being, you know, pulled out of the hat just to make things more. Attractive. Let's do this one really quickly. Uh, oil below the pre the the price before the invasion of Ukraine, and then so I have a question for you: energy stocks versus oil. This is a pretty stark dichotomy. Oil has basically round trip to where it was in January of 2022. Yeah. As though nothing ever happened. Right. Uh, quite a ride. But the stocks are staying higher. Yeah. So what is what is that? Because volumes are still good or? I, th- I think personally it's because valuations are so ridiculously cheap. Still? Still. 
So this is scary to me, though. This is, you know what this reminds me of? Like when Wiley e. Coyote runs off the cliff <laughs> and doesn't realize there's nothing below his feet and yeah. then looks down. Yeah. When you see oil prices down huge but energy equities up, I almost feel like at some point the sell side is going to come out and start saying, hey, guys, we might have to cut expectations for next year. But look at the forward curve. The forward curve is, you know. The forward curve of what? Of crude, okay. right? So you go out and look at crude for priced in 2024, 2025, substantially lower than today, right? So the equities are driving themselves off of the expectations for what the future is going to look like. There's not not no, today's price. Not today's price. So just Because like, these are long-term, long-duration assets, right? This is so. uh, crude spot. Crude oil is up uh, now 2% on the year. Uh, the XLE, which is energy stock ETF, is up 70%. Yeah, let's be I mean, clear. That's like this part in the cycle, energy should not be doing well, but it's been holding up remarkably well. I would say, you know, history usually will follow the script, call up 60% of, you know, what you'd expect to happen happens, but it's that 20% that doesn't happen. I know it's 40 differential, but the 20% that doesn't happen is really where you can make a lot of money. And one of the things this year that's been – uh, really the outlier is how well energy is held up given the weakness of the cycle because you would expect that energy would be at the tip of the spear of that and it hasn't that what hasn't percentage the of of the s p is energy now it's about five s- i was gonna say it's about six but it could be back five. up to six it's, it's, it's five or six but it's yeah. interesting that energy has been so strong despite crude and despite broader market weakness absolutely so energy is usually if you're looking for the foil right if you if you say i don't i never want to hold cash what sector can I own that's going to be a foil to the bear market, that's going to give me some type of relief in a bear market. Energy consistently is the best More one. than like gold miners or? Definitely more than gold, even more than healthcare. Uh, okay. Because oftentimes the, now this is, you know, hindsight bias, but oftentimes the weakness is a function of some type of supply shock, right? So you get a supply shock in energy, it crushes consumers, it crushes jobs, it, you know, they have to either raise rates to fight the dollar so the, the crude looks cheaper, whatever the case may be, benefits energy hugely. Does it work in inverse? If you get bullish on the S&P, does that mean that you should be less bullish on energy or not necessarily? Historically, yes. The, okay. there's, there's really only been in the last 60 years three, maybe four periods where energy has like consistently given you good performance. And this would be the fourth. I remember like uh, 04, 05, 06 was a big bull market for energy. Yeah. I can't remember anything since. Well, you know, there was there was also the time that during that time period, people were, this is one of the, you know, classic, uh, you know, heuristics in the business where people were like, well, the, the market can't go up if energy is going up. There's no way the market can go up if energy is going up. And really what that ended up being was China, right? What you had was this globalization where, the rising tide was lifting all boats, and it was lifting it faster than the input costs of energy were dragging things down. What is what is this? I was surprised to I was I was I had Nick take a look at the twelve month change between crude oil and energy stocks, and this is not that unusual to see energy stocks up bigly while crude is flat year over year. So this, what, surprised, this surprised me. I thought what is this for the people that aren't looking at the chart? I just what is this saying? All right, I I just said we're looking at the twelve month change in the price of XLE. Versus a twelve month change in crude oil, and it's a scatter plot. And I was expecting this to this, and it's at the zero. Percent. I was expecting the current dot to be like way out on an island by itself, and it's not at all. So this happens all the time, where you'll get a change in crude oil, and and energy stocks don't necessarily go in the same direction. Yeah. So it's, it's well, look at that range too, right? If you just do, if you draw just a vertical line, you're somewhere between up seventy and down. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, down yeah. 25, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, that so I guess the, the, price, the, bus the, the, the price of crude or the, the – the, yeah, the price of crude tells you less about energy stocks than I would have thought is the bottom line. Do you have the chart that I sent over? Uh, G, John, go ahead. So this is the free cash flow yield so versus is. enterprise value for the um, – for energy. So it never got cheaper. Never. That's why I had to rescale the chart. You can see it. Wow. And we're still up there. So these stocks are still undervalued and still technically look good. Yeah. You would stay with this trade. Yeah. Okay. We've actually gone to equal weight right here. Okay. Um, just because of the cycle, but we think there's an opportunity as it comes in. So what's your overarching message to people about 2023? Um, not like price targets and stuff, but just like how different do you think next year might be from this year or should we expect more of the same? Like what when you when people just like ask you casually, what do yeah. you tell them? Well, I, I tell them the how the game, casually, the, super <laughs> casually, right? like in the sauna, like 
<laughs> bad. In the Turkish bath. Uh, what right. do you tell? What was, do you tell? I was going to say cocktails, but I got cut off. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, I tell them the game has changed, and I, I tell them that the, you know, the one thing that there are very few people that are left in this business have seen is um, an environment where we were not in this sort of persistent downtrend for yields. Right, the bond bull market. So I think the the great bond bull market is over. That doesn't make me a huge bear on bonds, as you can tell. I think sure. there's some value there. Um, but within that, I think it's it's the the tailwind that we had is now going to be a quartering wind. You know, you don't you don't wind. think if the if the economic growth outlook falls apart midway through next year, we could be headed back to one percent interest rates. You really I, don't think so? I think we can get back to two. I don't think we're going to be able to get back to one. Okay. I, I think the low in yields has been hit, and you hit like you, generational. I low. think generational. Okay. Low. I feel like and a lower. I, yeah, and I think you. By the you way, it was very, stupid down there, and well, it didn't lead to anything good for say, You society. made a very good point, which was negative real rates. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've seen – and I can't believe people still argue this, but we saw the impact of negative real rates, which guess what that does? It makes Creates every – circus. It, yeah, it makes every asset have some value, right? And you can't differentiate between what is real and what is not. You have to really keep your wits about you. And we're seeing that now with crypto and the and the downfall of crypto. We saw it with – um, you know, with what we 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 uh, by the way, yeah, yes, concept capital, yeah, yes right? or no? SBF innocent? <laughs> no. Can you no imagine? Chance. It's the craziest shit you've ever seen. We're not going to spend twenty minutes on this. I'm just no. curious. I, I, you've never seen anything like this, right? No, but you can read. It. You can pick up a book, and you you can read plenty of stories. We did a podcast actually back in 2021 with a, a professor from the University of Minnesota who was specialized in the South Sea bubble. Because I, I just said. This, oh, yeah. you know, let's talk about the South there's Sea. There's so much right? in there. And there's so much in there. And, yeah, and yeah. you know, the one th the one parallel that that um, that I draw is the South Sea Company, you know, created the South Sea bubble. Uh, that was in 1720. Yeah. Do you know what year the South Sea Company finally went defunct? Oh, I just, I heard about 1780. 1853. Okay. 133 oh, wow. years it stuck around. They kept that right. Did running. anybody, did anybody wow. know what it was? Nobody cared. Who was, was the just, compliance officer was, there? <laughs> <laughs> So right. The point is, like, y you have to move on, right? You, you just you have to move on. So whatever you thought, we, we talked about with the Nasdaq, right? The the names that were populating the Nasdaq in two thousand are completely different than the names that populated it today. So if I hear you right, you're bullish on Solana. <laughs> so no, but so the instruments change, the players change, the companies change, but like the the, the two bullshit things, doesn't. The two things that never change are fear and greed. They're like the constants. Yeah, and that's like. Uh, for me, that's like the big takeaway. You'll always see different versions, but there's two things that don't change. And there's and there's regret. And I think one of the things that, mm. that investors that's need to understand as we go forward, um, watch relative strength. Because relative strength will be a very good indication. You can just do it on a sector level. But it'll be a very good indication of where the next leadership R is. What, RSI? No, no. Just uh, what's the just performance? Performance versus the S&P. Right? What's my performance versus the S&P? If you want to get cute, you can adjust it for volatility. You don't need to Whatever. do that. But, yeah. So, you know, w what we're seeing right now, which nobody believed, and, you know, I was scratching my head back six months ago, industrials. Industrials are helping to lead this tape. Industrials were were bottoming in June and, and coming out of this right. ferociously in July and August as the dollar was strong, as rates were going up. It didn't make any sense, but it was telling you that there's something good happening with these industrials that that probably has some staying power. Caterpillar looks kind of mean. Caterpillar, deer, Cummins engines. Dude, anything, de anything defense. Oh, deer, wow, huh. Anything defense, like any anyone making missiles or – those are all industrial stocks. So uh, did you have fun on the show today? It was great. Thank you. Was it everything that you thought it would be? Absolutely and more. Dude, we were, we were so excited to have you. Um, I think I think the – like our audience, uh, we have institutional people, you know, obviously follow the show. But just in general, like our audience I don't think has heard from – from you before in a lot of other places. Yeah. So this is like really special yeah, appearance for us. So th thank you very much. If I, could, if I could put in one, just plug. Absolutely. Oh, guys, we're going to do more than one plug. Well, you guys might want to try the Altoids before we start the show. Not <laughs> we do, do it throughout. <laughs> um, where could people, where could people learn more about your research product? Uh, what's, what's the URL? How do they find your stuff? Well, most, you know, we, we are, um, uh, a bit of a Twitter junkie firm, so uh, are you? Yeah, Redback LLC. We we're okay. always, you know usually once a day. I'm I'm publishing something. Neil's publishing something. Uh, little quips here and there. Um, so there's there's Twitter, Renmac LLC, and then at Renmac yeah, LLC. Okay, we'll and link to that. Renmac.com is uh, it's our website. And who who are your clients? 
Oh, it's 90% institutional. Um, we've got some RIAs, um, but it's mostly, call it 60, 65% long only. And commercial hedgers? 35. A lot of <laughs> we commercial, do have some hedgers, commercial hedgers, yes. For sure. Absolutely. But so, we also have some large speculators as well. So we have both sides. So I think, you, I think you do a great job. And a lot of the stuff that you're explaining is very complex for, you know, like the typical market follower. But I yeah. think you do a really good job at like, explaining it and then why it matters. Thank you. Right. Thank you. This is not just, these are not just lines on a chart. Here's why it matters. Yeah. So, look, I mean, this is a, this is a complex business, but like anything else, if you can't keep it simple, it's, you know, it's worthless. And so, you have a great team. Thank you. My team is fantastic. We love them. Jeff DeGraff, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So here's thank what we you. do. When we finish the podcast. We end with, um, favorites. Oh, talk about Yellowstone. So you have no, for real. I want, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I haven't watched one episode of this yet, and everyone is like yelling at me at this point. So I'm mm. going to do it. Uh, tell me about why Yellowstone is your favorite. Well, I would actually say 1883 is better. Is that than a Yellowstone. prequel series? That was I didn't a see that either. Series, yeah. Okay. That one's better. It's got Sam Elliott with a big bushy. I love that. Uh, Tom yeah, Hanks right? made a cameo. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's fantastic. It's better than Yellowstone. So, so I Yellowstone loved, is just great. I loved, loved the first three seasons. Yeah. Last year I thought sucked and this mm -hmm. year yeah. kind of disappointed again. Is there anything yeah. on Paramount Plus besides that that would justify just biting the bullet and adding another streaming service Have to Have you my seen, I, th uh, I don't know, I think it is, but The Offer, The Making of the Godfather. That, that's another thing people say that's is really fantastic. That's a Paramount. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'll, I'll add it up. What's the difference at this I'll give point? You my, I'll give you my password. I'm, pa I'm paying 700 different things <laughs> $8 a month. It's starting to add up. Uh, Michael, did you bring a favorite this week? I did. I'm so excited for this. Go ahead. Peanut M&Ms. I am all in on, there's a show called, uh, what the f*** is the name of the show? Fleischman is in Trouble. I don't know why I always draw a blank on the name of the show. Fleischman is in Trouble. It's with Jesse Eisenberg and Claire Danes. It's a very, very, very New York show. Is that yeah. FX? Who, what FX, is it FX slash Hulu. Okay. They get divorced. Um, he's a newly sing, a single guy in his fo early 40s discovering, you know, the scene, and uh, it's it's great. Michael, that was one of your recommendations on Animal Spirits. Well, I'm doubling down. <laughs> F*** off, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you did that. I like to I bring that energy every week. Fact checker. Duncan, Fact checker. Duncan, 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 uh, Duncan, I love you. Do you listen to what, – what podcast do you listen to? I'm not a big podcast guy. That's sad. I'm going to give you a good one. Acquired. Okay. It's a big – I mean, it's a huge show. Okay. Uh, Breaking news here. Acquired is no, a good podcast. No, of course. It's a huge podcast. Every week – I think it's every week – they take like a big company, big successful company usually, okay, and just like dive in deep and explain how the company became what it is. Nice. So you could picture them doing a lot of recently like technology companies, et cetera. They did Enron this week. Mm. They were basically like, how could we add something to the FTX conversation yeah. that, that would be meaningful? Let's do the Enron story, which is the thing that most people are comparing FTX to. Yeah, It's way more – I mean – it's an amazing story. I just thought they did such a good job telling the story of Enron for people who have like heard Enron, 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 but they don't really know what went on. Yeah. It's a really entertaining uh, episode. So shout to the acquired. They, they you listen a, to these guys, right? They did a huge one with with FTX, which was excellent. Maybe this was I mean, their probably, pen, probably, this was their <laughs> penance for doing probably an FTX did an age episode. Age great, but uh, no, they do great work. They, they, they did two and a half hours on Enron, and yeah. it was an incredible story. So they did FTX well before they the. Did F, they did. Sam was on their. Uh, Sam was on their show actually. <laughs> Sam was on the show talking about it. This is probably a year or two. By ago. the way, like he fooled everyone. Sam. Yeah. Sam was, dude. He had the naming rights for for. Uh, where the Miami Heat play, he had Super Bowl commercials. It's like MLB. his tentacles were check, yeah. check. His tentacles check. were everywhere. <laughs> yes. Um. All right. I also, so here's a dislike, and I have to just get this off my chest. The Rings of Power is the worst show I've oh, ever seen in my life. So disappointing. So, like, so disappointing. I love the the movies, and Token probably changed my life. I read The Hobbit when I was 11, and I wasn't. It was like somebody else's book, and I like took it. Like nobody told me read this, mm. and uh, I think I think that's probably the first like seven hundred page book I ever picked up, <laughs> and it made me want to write my own stuff. And I'm like kind of a writer now, so like I'm not a hater of any of this stuff. That show is just, I mean, you agree? Did you watch it? I, I haven't watched it. F unwatchable. <laughs> I, I have There's met not a few people one that scene liked that's it. entertaining. I slogged through three episodes and said, "No, you wait till the tenth. No. Ugh. So there that's are, what people were saying about Andor. Yeah. There are whole like reddits and whole pages all over the internet of like why is this show so bad? 
And there's not even a consensus. There are so many things that are bad about it. Things that don't get made in a normal, interested environment. That thing could probably cost a quarter billion dollars. How much How about this? Make? How cost. about this? Let me make you throw up. <laughs> they gave the token estate just for the rights to make the show $250 million. I swear to God. And then they took another $500 million to actually make this thing. So Once, one season, I swear, I think it's is it 10 episodes. So it costs a bit almost. It's like a billion dollar show and there's not bad. a frame of it that's enjoyable. It was very bad. So they, I do blame the Fed for, for this. It says season and one costs $462 million. Fine. Round it up to 500 and then 250 for uh, J.R.R. Token's great, great, great grandchild. And that's, <laughs> I mean. It's, and comparing that to Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon, which around the same time was By phenomenal. the way, they did this with Amazon stock price like 100% higher than where it is now. I don't think they would have done this. Yeah. I think they would have made maybe a mini series. All right, that's it. We're going to let you get out of here, Jeff. I know hey, it's, guys. Thanks so much. It's that's been a long fun. time. We, we, we loved having you. Thank you so much, Thank guys. You. Follow Jeff, follow Renaissance, uh, wherever they're putting that stuff. And uh, thanks for listening. We'll be back to you next week.